Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John devote nearly a third of their length to the last week of Jesus's life. Only two of the four books mention the events of his birth, and all four only offer a few pages on his resurrection. But each person gives a detailed account of the events leading to Jesus's death. Over the centuries, the story has grown familiar. So today, let's look at it again in a fresh way. Capture the emotions of the people, picture the setting, and take a walk with Jesus to the cross. We pick up the story after the Last Supper. It's late Thursday night. Jesus has already enjoyed his last meal with his disciples, and he shared with them all the things that are going to happen. He shares with them that all of them are going to fall away on account of him. You see, Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows that Peter is going to deny knowing him and that all the rest of his disciples will flee in the night to save their own skin. Judas disappears during the meal to go and betray Jesus. At the end of the meal, they sing a song and they head out to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's probably sometime after 11 o'clock at night. They walk into the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus has the disciples stay by the gate all of them except for Peter, James, and John. Jesus asks them to walk a little further with him. It's then that Jesus reveals what he's feeling. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Jesus goes about a stone's throw away and he begins to pray. These are some of the most agonizing hours for Jesus. Beyond the physical pain he will endure on the cross, Jesus now faces an intense spiritual battle. And so Jesus prays. And who does he pray for? Well, Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And the last people Jesus prays for was for you and me. You see, we were on his mind. The Bible says that Jesus was in such torment and prayed with such intensity that sweat drops of blood poured from his brow. A great struggle was underway. Matthew 26, 39 says, face down on the ground, Jesus prayed. My father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will, not mine. It was there in the garden of Gethsemane that Jesus decided that he would rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. As Jesus prayed, Judas came with the soldiers in a large crowd. The Bible says that Jesus headed straight for his accusers. The soldiers were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Judas has arranged a signal with the soldiers. The one I kiss is the man you are to arrest. Judas walked right up to Jesus It was then that Jesus looked Judas in the eyes and said, Judas, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas then walked right up to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. When Jesus' followers saw what was happening, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Jesus cried out, put your sword back in place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels. A legion of angels is 6,000 strong. So 12 legions of angels is 72,000 angels that Jesus could summon to fight a holy war on his behalf. When God wiped from the face of the earth the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, it took just two angels to do the job. Can you imagine the power and destruction that 72,000 angels could do? Jesus said, no more of this. And then he reached out to the high priest's servant and healed his ear. Jesus looked at the mob that had come to arrest him. And he said, 
Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you didn't lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus is bound and dragged away from the garden as his disciples flee into the night. In less than nine hours, Jesus will go through six different trials. Each trial was illegal according to the law, and each trial had one theme, crucify Jesus. The first trial was before Annas, the political boss of Jerusalem. Jesus is interrogated and questioned. When the officials don't like what Jesus says, they strike Jesus on the face. This is the first of many blows to his body. Simon Peter is following Jesus at a distance to see what will happen to him. He's out in the courtyard warming himself by a charcoal fire when a young woman asks Peter if he's one of Jesus' disciples. Peter cries out, I am not. A few moments later, another woman looks at Peter and says, this man was with him, referring to Jesus. But Peter denied it. He looked at her and screamed, woman, I don't know him. Jesus is taken away from Annas to go and stand trial before Caiaphas, the reigning high priest, while Peter follows at a distance. The chief witness, Judas, has disappeared into the night. We find out later that he's returned the money he received for betraying Jesus, and he's gone out in the night and has committed suicide. Judas' testimony was the key to having Jesus sentenced, but they can't find him. They quickly try to find other witnesses, They were obviously unprepared because none of their testimony agreed as required by the law. Frustrated, Caiaphas got to the main point. He resorted to a thing called the oath of a testimony. This required an answer from Jesus. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God that you tell us whether you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said, I am. In their minds, they now had the charges they were looking for, blasphemy against God. Matthew 26, verse 63 says, the high priest guards blindfolded Jesus and hit him with their fist. By dawn, his face and body would be black and blue. Jesus is then taken before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a religious Jewish council They hurled their accusations at Jesus, and while they yelled at him, Jesus remained silent. The high priest shouted, Are you not going to answer? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes and said, you all have heard blasphemy. And they all condemned Jesus as worthy of death. They spit in his face. They struck him with their fist and they slapped him. Prophesy, they said, who just hit you? They continued to beat Jesus and then led him outside to take Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, because they didn't have the power to have someone killed. Just before Jesus was led outside, Peter is waiting to see what might happen next. It was then that one of the high priest's servants recognized Peter and said, didn't I see you with Jesus in the olive grove? Peter looked at him and said, I don't know what you're talking about. It was at that very moment that the doors opened up leading Jesus outside and the rooster crowed and Jesus looked across the courtyard and looked into the eyes of Peter. Peter, seeing Jesus and realizing what he had done, ran away as fast as he could, and he wept bitterly. It's now daybreak. By this time, exhaustion and dehydration had severely weakened Jesus' body. They first told Pilate that Jesus refused to pay taxes to Caesar, but Pilate knew that was a lie. Pilate interrogated Jesus, but Jesus hardly spoke a word in his defense. Pilate knew the religious leaders were accusing Jesus of these crimes out of envy, 
Jesus had become much more popular than they were, and they saw Jesus as a threat to their power and their position. Pilate can't believe that Jesus won't defend himself, but Jesus wasn't about to do that. In Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah, there's a prophecy concerning the crucifixion of the Messiah. This prophecy was written hundreds of years before crucifixion had been invented as a means of execution. The detail is unbelievable as to what the Messiah will endure. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The religious leaders realized they weren't getting any traction with Pilate, so they accused Jesus of claiming to be a king. This was a much more serious accusation. Anyone who claimed to be a king was a threat to Caesar. But the priest unknowingly opened a way of escape for Pilate to not have to deal with Jesus. They said, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting with Galilee, even as far as this place. When Pilate heard that Jesus was a Galilean, he concluded that this matter was out of his jurisdiction. And he had Jesus sent to Herod Antipas, thinking that this was the end of the matter for him. Herod had wanted to see Jesus for quite some time. This is the Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. He asked Jesus many questions and asked him to perform miracles for him. Jesus stood in silence. Herod is the only person Jesus never spoke a word to. In what must have been a very frustrating time, Herod had Jesus turned over to his soldiers who dressed him in a robe and mocked and ridiculed him. Jesus was then sent back to Pilate. Pilate was disappointed to see Jesus back in his presence. Jesus was obviously innocent. Even Herod found no charge against him, and Pilate's wife had come to him and told him that she had a dream about Jesus. She told Pilate, don't you have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So Pilate tried to have Jesus released. He offered to the crowd to release one prisoner. He would release either Barabbas or Jesus. Barabbas was a murderer. The people rejoiced when he was captured. But now the people shouted for Jesus to be crucified and for Barabbas to be released. Pilate then decided to have Jesus flogged as an attempt to get him released. Flogging or scourging is called the half death. Six out of 10 people who were flogged died from the beating. Jesus was stripped, tied to a post with his hands over his head. Two or more Roman soldiers who flogged people for a living would begin to strike Jesus with their whips one after the other. The whip was made of nine leather strands and embedded in the leather were stone and metal and bone fragments designed to tear as well as bruise the flesh. Historians who wrote about Roman flogging said after it was over, it wasn't uncommon to be able to see some of the vital organs of the person that had been beaten. Again, from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 50, verse six. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The interesting thing to me was that Jesus did not beg for mercy, and that must have angered the soldiers. Mark 15, verse 16 says, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. A company is between 300 to 600 soldiers. They're gonna be certain to make Jesus the example. They stripped Jesus naked. They put another robe on him and placed a crown of thorns upon his head. They put a staff in his hand and they mock him as a king. The soldiers took the staff from him and beat him across the head over 
and over and over again. Now Jesus could have destroyed them all with one word, but he bore the shame and the humiliation. Pilate brought Jesus before the people, thinking Jesus had been punished enough. But the people in the crowd still demanded Jesus' death. They said to Pilate, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Pilate calls for a basin of water and washes his hands. He says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And then Pilate gave into the demands of the people and sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion. Legions of angels await Jesus' command. One word and the ordeal would be over. But Jesus remained silent. Jesus has been beaten punched, ridiculed, mocked, and humiliated. Now he picks up his cross and begins the journey to the place of the skull, Golgotha. The streets are lined with angry people, the same people only five days earlier that praised his name saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, are now insulting him, lashing out at him and trying to get to him. Somewhere along that stretch of road, Jesus, out of strength, falls under the weight of the cross, and Simon from Cyrene is chosen to carry the cross for Jesus. They get to Golgotha, and Jesus is crucified between two thieves. Crucifixion is a cruel means of execution. The Roman government outlawed this type of sentence on all Roman citizens. After Jesus' hands and feet are nailed to the cross, the difficulty for Jesus is to breathe. Jesus could breathe in, but he couldn't breathe out. The usual cause of death for a person being crucified was asphyxiation or suffocation and shock from a loss of blood. Jesus would have to push up on his feet that were nailed to continue to breathe in and breathe out. As Jesus is gasping for each breath, the crowd is mocking him. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. Oh, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. The soldiers mocked Jesus as well and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Of course, Jesus can save himself. But if he saves himself, there's no saving you and me. Someone has to die for the wrongs that we've done. Someone has to pay the debt we owe for our sin to a holy God so that we may be made right before him. The soldiers cast lot for Jesus' clothes as he hangs there on the cross. In the midst of all this chaos, Jesus speaks, and the first thing Jesus says from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Jesus is crucified between two thieves. One thief mocks Jesus, but the other comes to Jesus' defense. He says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus looks at the man and says, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus then makes sure that his mother is going to be taken care of after his death and entrust that responsibility to the only disciple who's there in Jesus's moment of need. He asked John to take care of Mary. Jesus has now hung on the cross for about three hours. It's now noon. This is the moment the sky grew dark. In fact, for three hours, the earth was covered in darkness. The universe is grieving and God said that it would. According to the prophet Amos, he writes, On that day, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I'll make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. A few moments later, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
You see, at this moment, all the sin of mankind was placed upon Jesus. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The most painful encounter for Jesus wasn't the nails that went through his feet and hands. It wasn't the mocking of the people. It wasn't the crown of thorns or the punches that landed on his face and body. The most painful encounter for Jesus was when all the sins of mankind were placed upon him. It was the first time that Jesus felt separation from God. It was the first time he felt the emptiness and loneliness and guilt that sin brings. Listen to me. Jesus didn't sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane because of the physical pain he was about to suffer. Jesus sweat drops of blood because he knew the spiritual agony that was going to be upon him. Here's the difference between what Jesus went through and anybody else who endured crucifixion. Jesus experienced a form of spiritual suffering that you and I can't even fathom in our minds that made his physical suffering almost non-existent, if you could imagine that. All of our sins was placed upon Jesus. Think of the darkest thing you've ever done. Think of the darkest things that the human race has ever done. All the evil, all the murder, all the lust, all of our addictions and perversions, all the hatred, all the prejudice, all the pornography, all the greed and selfishness, every wicked thought, all of our sin was laid on Jesus. What we see on the cross was more than suffering. It was the full horror of human sin. In that awful moment, God the Father turned his back on his son because Jesus became sin. And God heard Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus scream those words? So you and I would never have to. It's now three o'clock in the afternoon. Six hours after being placed on the cross, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. He was given some vinegar water and then took a deep breath and cried out, it is finished. I find it interesting that it was three o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus said, it is finished. It was the hour of the temple sacrifice. Less than a mile to the east, a priest leads a lamb to the slaughter to be sacrificed for the sins of the people. That priest is unaware that his work is now futile because the Lamb of God has been slaughtered on our behalf. Jesus' final words is that of a prayer. He prays, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then Jesus died. At that moment in time, an earthquake shook the land and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The prophets of old rose from their graves proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Roman centurion who had overseen Jesus' crucifixion said, surely this man was the Son of God. Jesus never did anything halfway. He didn't heal halfway. He didn't teach halfway, and when he paid the price for our sin, he paid it all. Why did he do it? Jesus saw you in a world that was broken, in a world that was so messed up. He saw you with an empty and thirsty soul, and he knew that there was no way that you could have a relationship with him unless he took your place and died for your sins. That should be me on the cross. He's done nothing wrong. Those should be my nails, my crown of thorns, my whipping. But Jesus took my place. The cross shouts out to us the love God has for us. Greater love has no one than this. Then he lay down his life for his friends.
Changed history.